How's it going, folks? Go ahead and write your name in there so I can keep a record of your attendance, please. Oh, Stephen. Jessica Shelley. And Brianna. And Jordan, you're here. Jasmine is here. Good. And Brooke. And Nathan is here. Okay. Glad you guys are not sick. Mr. Malakowski has been kind of sick. I don't know if you heard about that. He said he was going to go get uh, COVID testing uh, today to see if that's what he had. So I hope that doesn't mean that everybody in the science department has been around Mr. Malakowski is going to have this deal. Ashley. Shakira, okay. And Anisha. Good. Well, Monique should be there. She just shot me an email. You know, Stephen, right before we started this, before I got on the uh, YouTube, they sent a message and they said it's supposed to be up and running. Now, I have no uh, knowledge of that whatsoever because they just shipped it or just turned it on today. So <clears throat> what I think I'll do is I'll try to understand the instructions and come up with two or three questions on a test and ship it off to you guys. I'll give you a, you know, a day or two to look at it and see if you can figure out if, how you can uh, handle it. And um, from there, we'll see if we can work in some of the tests that we're supposed to be um, supposed to have already taken. Heather, how's it going? Dominique was just asking me something on an email, but she's not here. Oh, <laughs> I see. Uh, I don't know. I just don't know. Yes, I did, Jessica. I sure did. Jessica Sessions, I got you marked present. Thank you. Ah. 
what clinic do you work for, uh, Jessica uh, Shelley? Or do you work for a hospital or what? Hmm. Oh, okay. I don't see lace. This is Lace and Dominique. That's strange. Dominique just now we're together on that uh, email. Oh, I see. Hmm. Well, I hope that's not one of those viruses like the, uh, what was the name of that virus that created uh, problems with the development of the brain and the skull and so forth? The Zika virus, I think it was, transmitted by a mosquito. Okay, well, I guess that's about all that's going to show up today. I'm surprised Dominique's not here. Lace is not here. Okay, Paul's not here. Okay. I think it's called the Zika virus. Or, yeah, that looks, looks familiar. I'm not sure. Oh, Lace, there you are. Okay. Shay Wheeler, Shaq Wheeler, not there. Joshua Kayla. Okay. Okay, we got a little bit into chapter 11, didn't we? Um, any questions that you had back on? Chapter 10, anything come to your mind that you're um, not comfortable with? Because it looks like, well, we won't have the muscle test until later. The test that will be coming to you, hopefully, uh, next Wednesday, should be the test on the integumentary system and the skeletal system. Did you guys get a study guide? Checked your email? Found the study guide in there. Good. Okay. So we got out there too. At least to one of you. Okay. Good, Rihanna. Okay, that's encouraging. Sounds like everybody got a copy of it. So, if you don't have any questions on the muscle system, skeletal muscle, visceral muscle, or anything like that, we'll go on into on chapter 11. So, just off the top of your head, thank you, Anisha. Uh, what is the function of the nervous system or what functions are there associated with the nervous system?
point. Oh, good. Here we come. Okay, now that is a control center. That's a, that's a structure, not a function. Okay. Uh, that's good. You, you put that down, but you want to know the difference between a function and a structure. The structure has a function. Okay, what else we got out there? Brianna says sensory input. That's good. Sensory input. What comes to your mind, Brianna? Or let me ask somebody else. Um, let's see. Jessica Shelley, tell me what, what does sensory input mean to you? If someone said, what in the world is sensory input? What would you tell them? You're right, by the way, Brianna, that's correct. But I'm just trying to get you to use uh, other terms. What is sensory input uh, concerned with? Mm, integration's another function. We still have an answer what um, sensory input is. That's true, too, Stephen, but... We still haven't answered the question, what is sensory input? How would you explain that? Okay, signals go to the brain. Good, that's, that's getting there. That's good, uh, Brianna. Sensory input is gathering information about the environment. Do you guys have anything to eat before you came to class today at 2 o'clock? Anybody get a uh, breakfast or a brunch or a lunch? Or have you just uh, had a Pepsi or a Coke or something like that? That's good, Stephen. Sensory receptors collect information from the entire body. Give me an example of some of that information. <laughs> So, Kenya, when you say sure did, um, you had a breakfast or a brunch or something like that, right? How did it taste? How'd your breakfast taste, uh, Kenya? Or whatever it was you had at lunch. Anybody have anything? Kenya is not telling me what she had for, for breakfast or brunch or lunch. Anybody had something to eat? You're right about five senses. They they do pick up things. Uh, what sort of uh, what sort of signals that they uh, do they pick up? Okay, here's uh, Brianna. She says I had a bowl of cereal, and it tasted good, didn't it, Brianna? And Brooke, you did at Zaxby's. I guess all they serve there is chicken, right? So. And Kenya had boiled eggs, okay? Stephen, you, you had pretzels for breakfast? <laughs> That's a carbohydrate, isn't it? And no doubt it was probably uh, salty, wasn't it? That's what I'm trying to get you to think about is all those are from the environment. You put that pretzel in your mouth and you knew, I guess you like salt, like, like I'm on that uh, toasted bread. And so you recognized 
the uh, substance and that message went to your brain and you knew that you had something good to eat. Now, you mentioned something about from the entire body. Um, what drove you to eat the pretzel? What drove you to eat the eggs, Akinya? What drove you to eat the cereal, Brianna? Hunger. That's right. Messages from your stomach came to your brain and you knew that you were empty. And so you looked for something to, to fill that problem. Oh. Sorry that's happening, Ashley. That happened to a lot of us this morning. We just had to cut it off. But... Um, Mm. Got so many people on the internet, elementary school kids and so forth. That's right, I can you hunger. You're getting the questions late. Well, I can try and talk a little slower. Maybe give it time to get to you. So you, I'm just trying to get you to think about all the environmental stimuli that we are, in a sense, bombarded with. You can, you can look at something and you're picking up uh, a visual image in terms of the environment. You could smell things. You know, one, one of the things they say about the coronavirus is it may alter your smell, your ability to to sense things in your nasal passage, recognize, you know, a hamburger cooking or some chili on the stove or some hot biscuits coming out or chocolate chip cookies or whatever. So just trying to get you to think about the, the input there. Now, integration, integration means that the message that's coming in goes to a particular point and you make a choice about what you have just sensed. When you walk into a room and it's too cool or too warm, and you make choices, I'm going to go play with the thermostat, or I'm going to go put on a flannel shirt or whatever. So when you think of integration, integration involves neurons that connect various parts of your brain up. And so you make a choice to respond to the environmental stimuli. And of course, then you've got your, um, what they call your Motor output, that's on page 383. <laughs> well, I hope you don't turn blue, Steve. And the motor output might be putting on a shirt. Might be taking off a shirt, whatever. Going to the pantry or wherever you got your pretzels, that's a motor output. So your legs start moving toward a particular part of the house where you can pick up pretzels. And can you turn the stove on, put some water in it, got it hot, drop those eggs in it, boil them for 10 minutes, pull them out and have boiled eggs. So you got those three type of responses. You got to pick it up. Pick the response up, let it go to parts of your brain. Of course, this happens very quickly, doesn't it? 
Nobody sits there and waits for 10 minutes to find out that they need to take a shirt off. And then very quickly we respond to it. So you got uh, sensory input, you got inter integration so that you make the appropriate uh, movement. And then you send the message down to the um, to the muscles. Those muscles carry out what you want them to carry out. What is meant by the term autonomic? What is the term meant? What does the term autonomic mean? That's correct, Brianna. Independent. You do not have to think in terms of of um, getting this uh, system to do what it's supposed to do. It is programmed. So it maintains homeostasis in your body. So it's independent of your conscious thinking. Uh, those of you who had something to eat, uh, your visceral muscle, the circular layer, as well as the longitudinal area, uh, was working, pushing the food through your body, squeezing it up with the juices that come out of your digestive cells, and you're free to do something else. What do the two terms afferent and e efferent mean? What do those two terms mean? Afferent and efferent. That's correct, Jasmine. Afferent means toward, efferent means away. So when we talk about a sensory neuron, that is an afferent neuron. It takes a message to, as you said at the beginning of the lecture, a control center, which is our brain. We've got various uh, structures up there for uh, controlling uh, how we respond to a, to a stimulus. So afferent takes it to the brain, efferent takes it away from the brain. That's good. Okay, very good. Do you guys have any question about the axon, the structure, excuse me, the structure of the neuron, which is on page 385? So what are the two processes that uh, come together with a cell body to make up a neuron? What are the two processes? I don't remember if we covered those or not. The two processes. That's correct, Heather. So we talked about those. Is that correct?
Okay, good. So which way do the action potentials, the nerve impulses travel in respect to the cell body? What directions do the impulses, the action potentials, the nerve impulses, what direction do they travel in respect to the cell body? That's correct. Axons carry impulses away from the cell body. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And the dendrites bring impulses or you can use action potential. Um, that's another word for a nerve impulse. They bring messages, impulses to the cell body. Dominique, have you have you come in on this conversation? I don't see your name up there. She's okay. So as you look on page three eighty seven. In 387, first column, uh, come on past multipolar, bipolar, uh, pseudo unipolar, and so forth. We're not going to get into that. We come down to functional classification. And we've already covered two of those. Functionally, neurons are grouped into three classes based on the direction in which they carry information. You already know that sensory neurons will carry messages to the control center, right, Jasmine? That's what you said. And then you look over to the next column and you see motor neuron, about eight or ten lines down in bold print. And they're going to carry impulses away from the control center. But you've got this group, interneurons, sometimes called association neurons. And they relay messages within the brain. So we can get the message to the brain by the sensory neurons. But then it's got to go, as I said, to some at some place in your brain. And the interneurons are the ones that have lots of connections so that that information gives us as complete a picture as is possible. So you see it says, relays messages within the CNS primarily between sensory and motor neurons. So those according to function are sensory neurons, interneurons, and motor neurons.
Now, I want you to look over on page 388. As you look on page 388, this little camera here in this big book. See that picture? We want to talk about that picture because there are a number of uh, cells there that we want to be familiar with. You look at the um, left-hand side of the page and you see the term neuroglia. And as you look at the first uh, couple of sentences there, neuroglia, or sometimes they'll call them neuroglial cells. You can see that G-L-I-A-L, glial, has to do with glue. There's probably not a person alive today that hasn't had some association with glue. Holds things together. There's pieces of wood or pieces of china after you break off a, a little handle on a cup. So we look down at the, the bottom. Look at that figure 11.6. And you see the first one on the left-hand side, it says it's an astrocyte. And, of course, astro makes you think of uh, astronomy and sight. It's a cell, but astro reminds you of a star. And if you look at the uh, name and look, follow the little black line, you'll get some idea of why they wanted to name it an astrocyte. Now notice those little extensions. You see on that one cell, it's tacked on to uh, another cell, which we'll talk about in a minute, three times. And then you look on the opposite side of it and you see there's three more connections. And then you look to the left of the cell and you see there are Two more connections. The red that you see there is a capillary or an arteriole. And it could be even an artery, a small artery. Uh, come on up to the left a little bit, and you'll see another astrocyte. Looks pretty much like the one that is marked. But look at the connections. Got all these connections on the blood vessels. And then in that, that astrocyte has, what, one, two, three connections to the neuron body, cell body. So you get this picture that things are um, held in place. They're not just sliding around in our tissues. They're held in place by these cells. So now go, um, go to the bottom of that page and you see where uh, the functions are listed for the astrocyte, anchors, neurons, and blood vessels. That's one function. And then come down to the third one where it says facilitate. Facilitate the formation of the blood brain barrier. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of the blood brain barrier. 
But this is how uh, the blood-brain barrier, uh, this is what it's composed of. These astrocytes that hook on to the capillaries. So the, the point there is if you'll look over uh, on the next page, 389, You come down that first column and you see it says assisting in the formation of the blood-brain barrier. Come down to one, one, two, three, four lines. You see over there it says these tight junctions render the capillaries virtually impermeable to most proteins and polar compounds. Polar compounds, of course, what comes to your mind when you think of a polar compound? Versus a non-polar compound. See, these things keep coming back. That's why you want to review them ever so often, like once a week. Just want to keep them straight in your head. If you keep studying like that, then you will have been studying for the final exam all semester long. Okay, Kenya says something about hydrophilic. So... Um, when it says uh, polar compounds, they're hydrophilic, aren't they? Yeah. That's a big word. What does it mean, hydrophilic? Nobody can remember what hydrophilic means? Or are we just uh, waiting on really slow transmission? Good. Yep, likes water, that's for sure. Hydrophilic. So that's a protective mechanism. That's right. Loves water, order liking. Good, very good. Looks like the... Uh, site just bundled all of your responses and boom, threw them right in. I can see this thing's about two seconds slow. Uh, so that's there to protect the brain. That's also a problem when you have a brain infection, let's say a bacterial brain infection. It's difficult to get the antibiotic into the brain to destroy the bacteria. When it says blood-brain barrier, that's what it means. It tends to keep things out. It's there for protection, but it's also got its uh, downside too. And then there's a third thing I want you to know about these astrocytes. Look at the next bullet down there where you see repair repairs brain tissue now before we leave the uh, astrocytes <clears throat> look at the last little paragraph on page 389 and you see it says they're critical, astrocytes are critical to normal functioning and so forth. 
But if they become cancerous, could be benign versus malignant. What's the difference between benign and malignant? Well, they can both be a form of cancers. Um, okay, this is a good one, Kenya. Benign doesn't spread. That's right, it's still a cancer, but it just doesn't spread. Whereas with malignant, that means it's going to spread. So you, it's nice to hear that... Um, like Heather says, some, somewhat okay, but malignant affects more tissues. Of course, the problem with it being in one place is it could grow, maybe not outside of your brain, and spread to um, your GI tract or something like that. But uh, it could still get large enough to where it puts pressure on other tissues in the brain, and that can result in some lacking responses or perception or something like that. So we hope we don't get any astrocytomas. Now let's let's go back to this chart. Go back to the chart and look at the next cell over from the left and you see oligodendrocyte. So you follow that arrow, and you can see a number of those kind of purplish blue uh, cells. And they also have processes or extensions from the cell body. And what they do is they wrap around the axons. So you... When I say wrap around the axons, another way to say that is you see right below oligodendrocyte, they myelinate certain axons in the central nervous system. So what in the word is myelin? Let's look over on page 390 for just a second. Page 390. So in that first column on page 390, you see as you come down past two and three, it says, as we discuss, certain neuroglia wrap themselves around the axons to create a structure known as a myelin sheath. A myelin sheath. Now look at the definition for it. Composed of repeating layers of the plasma membrane of the neuroglial cell. It has the same substances as any plasma membrane, that phospholipid bilayer. That's essential. That's why we got to have lipids and we got to have phosphorus and so forth. 
and you see it says other lipids and proteins. It says the main components, various lipids up at the top of the next page, and it says cholesterol, phospholipids, and so forth. So when we go back to this oligodendrocyte, well, let's see, there's one other thing I want to say about that. Come to the second paragraph on page 390. Come to the second paragraph, second column on page 390. You see it says, in the fluids of the body, electric current is the movement of ions. Can you think of some ions that we've talked about so far? How about it, Lace? Can you name a ion that we've talked about? I have to come over here because this is such a small print over here on this little uh, surface, they call it. Anybody think of an ion? Good, that's right, Brianna. Sodium, good. Anybody think of another one? Okay, you got a CA in there. That's calcium. Good. We just got through talking about how we need calcium for muscle contraction. Okay. That's good, Stephen. Calcium, that's right. Okay. Just trying to get you to think about that because those are ions that can uh, be involved in creating electrical fields. So, keep reading now on page 390. We're back to where it says uh, electric current is the movement of ions like sodium. Ions do not easily pass through the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane. And so the high lipid content of myelin makes it an excellent insulator of electric current. Most of you probably know about insulation in some way. Uh, you know, you got it in your attic and so forth. And so uh, if you were to, and maybe some of you know where your uh, fuse box is, or sometimes they'll call it a panel, electrical panel, and that's where you'll have all the breakers uh, lined up, and you'll have your wires that run through the walls come down to the breaker. And those wires are insulated. So that's, we're talking about this myelin. And so you see it says it's an excellent, excellent insulator of, ele of electric current akin to rubber tubing around a copper wire. Notice the next uh, sentence. The overall effect of this insulation is to increase the speed of the conduction of action potentials. Now remember, action potential is the same thing as a nerve impulse. It's a message that travels down the axon to some other neuron, or it could end up somewhere uh, at a muscle, or it could be at a brain. Oh, did I say brain? Excuse me. I meant to say gland. Sorry about that.
Now, I want you to notice the next sentence. It increases the speed of the conduction of action potentials. Then you see it says myelinated axons. Conduct action potentials 15 to 150 times faster than an unmyelinated axon. So myelin's good. Let's go back to that page on 388, unless you have a question about the oligodendrocyte. There's a little bit of uh, a comment on oligodendrocytes on 389. First column, come all the way down to where you see oligodendrocytes. Oh, do you see their little arms sticking out like little fingers or whatever? And they wrap up the, some of the axon. Don't cover that all the way, but they'll wrap it up. Oligodendrocytes, as you look at the, the function down below under oligodendrocyte on page 388, myelinate certain axons in the CNS which is the central nervous system. And that's going to be um, in your brain and in your spinal cord. So that's where oligodendrocytes would myelinate an axon. So, looking on this uh, figure 11.6, we're moving to the right, and you see my crogleal cell. Some of you may have seen some of those little brittle stars, little starfishes. They come, it's not a fish. It's in the group called a kinoderm. It's a different creature from a fish. But uh, they kind of look like that. That skinny little arms. Some big ones got some big, thick arms. They'll get on top of a clam and they'll close around it and they'll pop that clam open. They got strong muscles. And then they'll eat that clam. So anyway, you see there's a microglial cell. Underneath, and by the way, this cell, microglial, it stays in the nervous system. It stays in the nervous, nervous system. What I want you to do is where it says microglial cell, I want you to write this. Write this under the microglial cell. What do I want you to write? Fixed phagocyte. Fixed phagocyte. Now, the reason we call it a fixed phagocyte is although it's produced in the bone marrow, you remember how we talked about the bone marrow? And you have some bone marrow up here in your sternum. You've got some in your ileum. So uh, that's where our blood cells are produced. So all these 
phagocytic cells, monocytes, and neutrophils, some of them become what they call a fixed phagocyte. We don't understand that. All we can do sometimes is look at it and say, well, I've seen that there before. And so this little fella stays in the uh, cerebrospinal fluid. You guys have probably heard of a spinal tap before. And if you pull that fluid out, you might find a macrophage in it. Sometimes they call them a fixed macrophage too. Macro meaning they, um, they eat quite a bit. But they're there to protect you, to protect me. So if something gets in there that's not supposed to be there, it's going to give its life for you, just like some of you have dogs that um, would die for you. It's going to protect you. Questions so far? Let's look at this last, um, well, it's not the last, we actually have a couple more, but um, ependymal cells, ependymal. These are all in the central nervous system. And notice what those pink cells have uh, toward the right, poking down a little bit. They're pink and they look like they got some little fingers coming off um, on the left side. But to the right, you see the real slender things? Those are cilia. Now look over to the right, right across to the first column and come all the way to the bottom on that next page and you see ependymal cells within the brain and the spinal cord. They're fluid-filled cavities which have ciliated neuroglia known as ependymal cells. I want you to take your book just for a second, and I want you to look on page 445. Look on page 445, and you will see a figure down at the bottom called 1219. And as you look at the sort of light brown tannish brain with all the wrinkles on it and so forth, you see this contrasting blue color and an unusual shape. You come down to the where the medulla is down at the bottom, and you're seeing a real thin um, canal. So that blue structure is hollow. There's actually two of those. Um, you see it says um, anterior horn and posterior horn. You got one on this side of your head. You got one on this side of your head. They're called ventricles. You don't have to know it right now. Uh, but they're hollow. And then you see where there's a it looks like a little woody woodpecker head. And you see it says third ventricle, and right underneath third ventricle, skip that word cerebral aqueduct, you come down to fourth ventricle. Those are cavities within our brains. And fluid is in those cavities. And it's not static. 
It's always moving because these ependable cells are always beating and they move it through those cavities, through those ventricles. Some of that fluid gets out. If you see the fourth ventricle, some of that fluid comes out. And that is what our brain floats in. Our brain is encased in fluid, so it can move slightly in our skulls. It's a protective measure. And those ependable cells are always moving that fluid, circulating it, so we have fresh fluid around our brain all the time. You okay so far? Just trying to give you an idea where those ependable, ependable cells are. They're in those ventricles and they move what we call cerebrospinal fluid along. Now let's look at a couple of other cells and then we'll wrap it up. Here's page 389. And you see neuroglia in the PNS. What we've looked at are one, two, three, four cells that support neurons in the central nervous system. We've just covered four support cells for the neurons. Now we have a couple of more cells that we want to look at. Those are outside of the central nervous system. They're in the peripheral nervous system. And as you see in the first uh, heading underneath neuroglia in the PNS, you see two types of neuroglia, the Schwann cell and the satellite cells. Look at 11.7, right above, top of that second column. And you can see that the satellite cells surround the cell bodies. Those are the little kind of reddish ones. We're not told necessarily uh, all the things those satellite cells do, but they support the cell bodies. And then the other one is called that Schwann cell. And you see it myelinates axons, certain axons. Again, that's a type of insulation. And it helps the um, helps the current keeps the current from spreading out all over the body. Increases the speed of the nerve impulse. Increases the speed of the action potential. As you look on page 390, you see this picture, figure 11-8. You see these little sections of these cells that wrap around the axons. You see over to the right says a Schwann cell. And you see the little um, open spaces. 
And those open spaces are called uh, the nodes of raw VA. Those are the little exposed area of the axon. The part that's covered by the Schwann cell uh, it is called the internode. So that is between two nodes of Rolvier. Rolvier is a person, maybe a physician, a uh, Frenchman. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, well, we're going to knock off. If you don't have any questions, um, keep studying. Got that um, study guide I sent you. You guys ought to make good, good on this third test. As soon as I get things squared away, I'm going to send you a practice test. And then we can move on and get some of these tests out of the way. Hopefully you're doing your homework. Make sure you do those. You've got, uh, I think it's dates that Mr. Malakowski put in there. You've got to have it done by. Don't miss that. Those are easy A's. He can pull you out of the fire. Okay. If you have no questions, then you have a good weekend. Six feet, right? Don't get in crowds. Hopefully Mr. Malakowski doesn't have this stuff. And I don't want to hear about you guys getting it. Be smart, okay? See you later.